Church is boring to me. Do I really need to go to church? Just because something's boring doesn't mean it should be ignored. I mean, think about it. Like history class or math or English class. Sometimes these things are boring, but you shouldn't just drop out of school. I mean, sometimes work's even boring. But if you quit work, then you won't be able to, you know, have any money and you won't be able to, be able to live. So, you know, just because these things are boring sometimes doesn't mean they you should quit them, you know, because they have long-term benefits. And in the same way, church, you know, if you go to church, church, you know, teaches you. Sometimes in church is where you learn, you know, the ways to eternal life, how to live as a Christian. You get encouragement, you get spiritual strength in church. And so, no, just because church is boring sometimes, you know, doesn't mean you should not go. Um, instead, once you go with a purpose, you know, when you read your Bible, you know, don't just read it, but study it. Um, when you listen to the sermon, you know, listen like you're going to be graded on it. Because ultimately, one day you will. Okay. How can God be three beings when the Bible says there's only one? The Trinity is confusing to some people, but the answer is actually very simple. Um, the principle is found in Genesis 2.24, where a man and a woman join and become one flesh. In the same way, while their man and woman are two separate beings, but they are one in purpose, God the Father, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus Christ are three separate beings, but they are one in purpose. You know, again, kind of like a marriage or maybe maybe even a you know, couple people working together on the same job. You know, they're working together towards one purpose. All their decisions are, are the same decision because they're all working for that same purpose or that same cause. You know, that's how God the Father and Jesus and the Holy Spirit can be three separate beings, but at the same time, they're one. You know, they're, they're, again, they're one in purpose. They're one in all that they do. And so, you know, while God the Father, you know, he's kind of behind the scenes, kind of in the control center, you know, where no one sees him up in the office, the higher office. You know, Jesus is out there working on the floor. You know, he's more of the physical attribute where, where he's actually out there with the people. While the Holy Spirit, he's more like a, uh, more like a, a speaker, a microphone, or even an internal phone device um, where he communicates Jesus communicates to us through the Holy Spirit, you know, and so while, you know, God the Father, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus are three separate beings, they're actually all, you know, one God working towards one purpose. Why is God so against gay people if he made him like that? Actually, God isn't against gay people, and he didn't make them like that. While it's true, the Bible says, you know, that uh, homosexuality is a sin. The Bible talks about that in Romans 1.27 very plainly. You know, some preachers today try to twist around the Bible to say it's okay, but it's really not. It's very clear in the Bible that homosexuality is a sin. But, you know, one of the things that a lot of people don't think about here is that they say, well, why, why did God, you know, let people be born that way? Well, the fact is we're all born in sin. We're all born with a totally sinful heart. Um, Psalms 51.5 says we're just born in sin. It says we're born with this problem. And because we're born with this totally selfish, selfish nature, we need a total heart change. All of us, everybody does. Um, the problem, you know, Exodus 34, 6 and 7 says that um, sin passes down through us genetically. And so all of us have, uh, you know, these dispensations towards certain kind of sins. All of us have propensities for different kinds of sins, you know. And so while, you know, maybe, you know, homosexuality or alcohol or, you know, whatever, whatever sin you might have, you know, we're all, in a, in a sense, we're in the same boat. Well, Matthew 5, 28, Jesus even tells us that, you know, even for heter heterosexuals to look at a woman to lust for her, to look at the opposite sex and lust is a sin. And so, so naturally, we all have these sinful passions and sinful desires, you know, and homosexuals, you know, often, you know, 
argue, well, yeah, but we're born with a nature that's impossible to change. We can't change by ourselves. Well, really, the sinful nature, you know, that I was born with is the same nature. It is impossible, would have been impossible for me to change. In fact, without conversion, if I wasn't totally converted, I would be totally sinful. And so, so God can change the nature. He's changed my very nature through conversion. He's, he's taken away, you know, while I didn't have homosexual tendencies, I had tendencies towards other sins. And I've had a totally sinful heart, and God totally changed it and put in me desires for holiness and, and desires for, you know, God, godly things. And so God has totally changed me, and I know he can do it to homosexuals too, because I've seen, you know, tons of testimonies on YouTube, you know, where, you know, gay people have surrendered their lives to Christ and been converted and changed. So it is possible, uh, you know, for gays to be totally changed. So, you know, really, God doesn't hate gay people. He didn't make people like that, and he's, he's calling them, you know, to turn and surrender their lives to him so that he can make, make something beautiful out of them. Is it okay for a Christian to need a non-Christian? Let's spend a moment just considering your future. You know, once the magic of romance fades, then your relationship begins to build on your personal beliefs and convictions. Now, think about this. If, you're, if, the, if the heart of your relationship, you know, the very core of your relationship, then begins to build on your beliefs and convictions, and the two of you have different beliefs and convictions, that's going to put a terrible strain on the relationship, and it's going to set you up for defeat. That's why, you know, 2 Corinthians 6.14 says, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. You know, a lot of people, you know, get into relationships with, you know, non-Christians, thinking that they're going to convert the non-Christian and make them a Christian. Well, occasionally that happens, but most of the time it doesn't work, actually. And the Bible gives many examples, you know. You look at the life of Solomon, um, who married many pagan wives, or King Ahab, who married a, a very wicked pagan you know, wife, and both of them were led astray by their wives. You know? And um, you see that the reality is, you know, usually the pagans usually pull the Christian you know, a little further away from God, and sometimes so far that they become lost. You know? So Proverbs uh, 6, 27, urges us not to bring fire into your bosom and think you're not going to get burned. The reality is, if you bring fire into your fire up to you into your bosom, it will burn you. Be careful about your lifelong partner. It's a very serious decision and it will affect your whole life and even your eternity. So be very careful how you choose. I'm confused. Are we saved by faith or works? I understand why some people get confused with this, you know. Um, Paul says in Romans 3.28 that we're saved by faith, while James 2.21 says we're saved by works, you know, and so are these, are these two saying different things? Are they contradicting each other? Actually, they're not. Uh, the point is, you know, if we believe, if we have faith, we'll actually do something about it. There'll be following actions, you know. And so, you know, for example, if you heard that your city was going to blow up at midnight, you know, and you believed it, you would actually do whatever it takes to get out of the city, you know? You'd do something about it, you know? And that's that's why, you know, James 2:17 says faith without works is dead faith. It's not real faith. You know, so those people who claim to believe in God but don't do anything about it, um, they don't have real faith, you know, because the bottom line is faith and works can't be separated. They go together. You know, faith without works is dead. Is it okay for Christians to drink alcohol in moderation? Some say that Christians should totally avoid alcohol, while others say that, you know, drinking is okay in moderation. However, one thing that all Christians agree on is that Getting drunk is a sin. 
Jesus actually warns against getting drunk in Luke 21, 34, and 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10 says that drunkards will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. You know, that doesn't just mean some people think drunkards is just talking about alcoholics. Well, no, drunkards are actually people who drink for the purpose of getting drunk. Now that includes even, you know, for the purpose of getting a little buzz. You know, there's even a commercial out that says, buzzed driving is drunk driving. And so if we're drinking for the purpose of getting drunk, we're actually clearly violating God's will. And, you know, when we drink and, and even get a little bit buzzed, you know, it lowers our inhibitions and it makes it much easier to fall into sin. And so, you know, I think the clearest path for Christians is, is a total abstinence from alcohol, very clearly our safest path.